Hi, this is Dr. Peter Grinspoon. Thanks for joining my YouTube channel. Today we're going to talk about cannabis hyperemesis syndrome. Before we get started, if you look at the bottom right of your screen, you can subscribe to my YouTube channel. It's free and we have all kinds of related content on different drugs and on addiction. So anyways, Dr. Peter Grinspoon here talking about cannabis hyperemesis syndrome. Very weird that cannabis could actually make you throw up. Cannabis is used widely by millions of Americans, by probably tens to hundreds of millions of people worldwide to help them with nausea and vomiting and other various gastrointestinal symptoms. It helps with gastroparesis when the stomach doesn't empty well. It helps with irritable bowel syndrome. It helps with colitis symptoms. And most importantly, it helps with chemotherapy induced nausea and vomiting. Most cancer patients find tremendous relief from the nausea and vomiting that comes from chemotherapy uh, from cancer. So how is it the cannabis can cause nausea and vomiting? Because that's what cannabis hyperemesis syndrome is. It's a syndrome among heavy cannabis users, typically heavy daily cannabis users. And if they smoke and smoke and smoke, or I guess consume edibles as well, they can have these intense vomiting syndromes where they actually end up uh, in the emergency department several times a month at great expense and at great misery. Uh, as we'll talk about, they need intravenous fluids and very, very, very heavy duty uh, medications to stop them vomiting. So how is it the cannabis can cause vomiting? There are two components to this. One is some drugs have paradoxical reaction and some drugs have biphasic effect. A paradoxical reaction of a drug is when it is expected to act one way and it actually acts in the opposite manner. A good example of this is Benadryl or diphenhydramine, which is the antihistamine that makes us less itchy, but also makes us very sleepy. This is the active ingredient in Tylenol PM, a sleeping medication because Benadryl or diphenhydramine makes you sleepy, but in a small subset of patients, it makes them really, really wired and wide awake. It has a paradoxical or opposite reaction. Another example of this might be barbiturates. Most people, barbiturates, phenobarbital, make people very, very sleepy and groggy. They're very heavy duty uh, sedatives, but in a small minority, people can get really, really excitable and wide awake. So sometimes drugs can have a paradoxical reaction. Secondly, there's a biphasic reaction for some drugs, meaning that they have a different effect at low doses than they do at high doses. The perfect example of this actually is cannabis. In a low doses, cannabis helps most people with their anxiety, it helps calm them down, it helps mellow them out and helps them with their stress and their anxiety. At, if you take too high a dose of cannabis, it can drastically increase your anxiety. Any of us who have accidentally take a, taken too high a dose of a gummy or an edible can, can attest that cannabis at a high level can actually greatly worsen anxiety. It's a biphasic reaction, a different effect at a low dose than at a high dose. Now, cannabis for nausea and vomiting falls into these two categories. Number one, the vomiting, it helps most people with vomiting and with nausea. And so it can have a, it can have a paradoxical effect on some people and cause this awful syndrome called cannabis hyperemesis syndrome. And second of all, it can be biphasic. At low doses, people don't get cannabis hyperemesis syndrome. You don't get it from like a puff of cannabis, a so sociable puff of cannabis at a party. You don't get it, a medical patient taking a very small dose of their tincture twice a day doesn't get cannabis hyperemesis. It tends to be these heavy, heavy daily users. It most common is men between age 16 and 34. Uh, unfortunately, some people use cannabis to excess and you know they puff on their vaporizer all day. The, the more you use it, the less benefit you get and the less it works. But you know, and some of these people are addicted, but that's sort of another topic. If you use cannabis every day and you use it very, very heavily, you can develop this paradoxical reaction where you vomiting and barfing extremely heavily. And I've had patients that have to spend like two or three nights a month in the emergency department. The average cost is like $50,000, but the cost to the patient is just awful. They're in the emergency department. They're dehydrated. Their kidneys are failing. Rarely they can have uh, seizures and muscle breakdown. You're vomiting so hard you could have esophageal in injuries or something called pneumomediastinum where you barf so hard you actually rip a hole in the inside of your lung. Uh, it's a really, really serious thing. To treat it, we give people intravenous fluids to help rehydrate them, to help protect the kidneys. We replete 
the electrolytes, which can be dangerously depleted, like your phosphorus, your calcium, your magnesium. And, um, you know, ironically, with cannabis hyperemesis syndrome, some of the main medications that we use don't work that well. Even more ironically, when someone gives a history of taking frequent hot baths and hot showers, that can actually be a clue to the diagnosis of cannabis hyperemesis syndrome. It's a really, really weird thing where people with cannabis hyperemesis take hot baths and hot showers, and that tends to temporarily alleviate the symptoms. So that could be a diagnostic clue. If someone's in the emergency room with cannabis hyperemesis syndrome, we use the usual medications, Compazine, which is Prochlorperazine, and Zofran, which is Ondansetron. Many of you have heard of these, but they don't tend to work very well with cannabis hyperemesis syndrome. And we have to escalate to these heavy, heavy duty medications. Like it's a really big deal. We're giving intravenous Haldol or Haloperidol, which is an antipsychotic medication used for schizophrenia. That's the only thing that can stop the vomiting. And we're using intravenous Ativan or Lorazepam, a heavy duty sedative. So it's very difficult to get people uh, to stop using, um, to, to, to stop vomiting during cannabis hyperemesis syndrome. Now, interestingly, with cannabis hyperemesis syndrome, it has gone from being underdiagnosed to overdiagnosed. Um, before the year 2004, we didn't even know what it was or have a definition of it. It never was diagnosed before 2004. And then starting in 2004, it was, it was well-defined as a syndrome, but many doctors just didn't think of it in the emergency department because people, you know, doctors associate cannabis rightly with helping with nausea and vomiting. So why would they think that the cannabis was causing the nausea and vomiting? And also, you know, during the war on drugs, uh, people weren't particularly forthcoming about their cannabis use. Uh, why get in trouble um, so with the authorities? So, you know, without the admission of the use of cannabis, there was no uh, cannabis hyperemesis syndrome. You can't have it without cannabis. Um, now it's a fashionable diagnosis. It's in the press all the time. And anytime a patient comes in with any history of cannabis use and any nausea or vomiting for any reason, unfortunately, they get the diagnosis of cannabis hyperemesis syndrome. And it really doesn't help people to give them the wrong diagnosis. For example, there's a syndrome that's very close called uh, cyclic vomiting syndrome. Cyclic vomiting syndrome, just like cannabis hyperemesis syndrome. Um, people treat cyclic vomiting syndrome with cannabis because cyclic vomiting syndrome is very similar to migraines. Cannabis works really well for migraines. So if someone comes in with vomiting and cannabis use, they very likely could have cyclic vomiting syndrome, but because of the vomiting, the nausea, and the cannabis use, they automatically get a diagnosis of cannabis hyperemesis syndrome. Then this is used by the prohibitionists. Look how evil cannabis is. Of course, cannabis has its harms, but we certainly don't want to exaggerate them in the same way we don't want to minimize them. So how do you find out if it is cannabis hyperemesis syndrome? How do you distinguish it from the very similar presenting cyclic vomiting syndrome? The only way to distinguish them is to stop cannabis use completely for three to six months. If you stop cannabis for three to six months, the nausea, the vomiting, the emergency department visits completely go away, then obviously cannabis was causing it and it was cannabis hyperemesis syndrome. And the patient should never use cannabis again or, or maybe, maybe use it mildly, occasionally at a very low dose. You stop cannabis for three to six months and the vomiting continues, the miserable overnight stays in the emergency department continue, then it's cyclic vomiting syndrome. Uh, the treatments are overlapping, but it's really, really important to make a correct diagnosis. Now, even though it's overdiagnosed, I do think that the incidence of cyclic vomiting, excuse me, of cannabis hyperemesis syndrome is going up for two reasons. Number one, um, more people are using cannabis. And number two, cannabis is a lot stronger. People are using these really, really strong uh, concentrates. Um, they're like 95% THC. And, and even without that, the cannabis used to be 5, 10% THC. Now it's like 28% THC. People are using very, very high amounts of cannabis, high doses, and that's exactly what can trigger cyclic uh, cannabis hyperemesis syndrome. So it's overdiagnosed and the rates are going up just to make it like everything else cannabis related confusing. So where do we go from here? Number one, um, educate people about this. Number two, educate emergency room doctors that if someone comes in, they're vomiting, they're on cannabis, it doesn't necessarily mean cannabis hyperemesis. You have to really evaluate other 
options uh, such as cyclic vomiting syndrome. And again, the only treatment is to get people to stop using cannabis for three to six months, which can be really, really difficult. People can get addicted to cannabis. They can get dependent on cannabis. There are no FDA approved medications to get people off of cannabis. So it's not as easy as it seems to simply, it's easy to say it, but to get people to stop using cannabis for three to six months can be really, really difficult. I have patients that literally can't stop using it even though they're in the ER like two or three times a month. It is awful. I think we fetishize high THC and that people breed the THC up and if you go into the dispensary, all the THC is higher than 20%. Not only is that a setup for cyclic, for cannabis hyperemesis syndrome, it's a setup for, for psychosis, which really strong cannabis can contribute to. And it's a setup for addiction. You know, with any drug that causes euphoria and relaxation, a certain percentage of people can get addicted to it. So I think if we bred down the THC and bred up some of the other more healthful cannabinoids such as CBC, we'd have less uh, cannabis hyperemesis syndrome and also less addiction and psychosis. So we could do a lot better with lowering the THC, uh, educating people about uh, these conditions. Now, really important to continue to get cannabis out of the shadows and to make it so doctors and patients can have open, clear, and honest discussion about cannabis use. That way, if people need help, they can get help and doctors will know what's going on and they won't uh, be as much confusion and discord. And then finally, we really want people to buy cannabis through the legal system. In the states, in the 38 states where medical marijuana is legal, unfortunately, it's not 50 states yet, we're working on it. If you buy cannabis legally, it's labeled, it's tested, you know there's no heavy metals, no lead, no pesticides, no fungus. All these things certainly wouldn't help if you're suffering from cannabis hyperemesis syndrome. So anyways, paradoxical reaction, cannabis in heavy users can cause nausea, vomiting in emergency departments. It's really dangerous. We wanna have clear and accurate information about this. So it's not underdiagnosed, it's not overdiagnosed, and so that it can be prevented and treated accurately. This is Peter Grinspoon. Thank you so much for joining my YouTube channel.